Good afternoon. I'm Councillor Peter Marland and I'm Chair of the Milton Keynes Health and Wellbeing Board. The Board is a key forum for leaders in the health and social care sectors and, and um, VCS sectors in Milton Keynes to come together to ensure an integrated and coordinated approach across the NHS, social care and public health services. This meeting is being held remotely. Board members, other councillors and public participation is via video and audio conferencing which is being streamed live on the council's YouTube channel. In addition to members of the board, we have a number and any other councillors present, a number of officer colleagues including democratic services officers who are either present online or in the civic offices. Um, can I ask all board members to keep their cameras off and their microphones to mute um, unless you, you wish to speak. If you wish to speak, could you press the raise hand function, please? A uh, member of the Democratic Services team will alert me, and then I will call you to speak. Could you please enable your camera and your microphone um, when do so? And we're going to have a test in a minute while you all introduce yourselves. Um, uh, lost connectivity. In the event that the, anybody loses connectivity, the meeting will be paused, um, and I... I've got a phone number which you should have, um, and then if you can't get it back on rule, we will continue. Um, welcome and introductions. I have apologies from Patricia Davis from the CCG and Joe Harrison from Milton Keynes University Hospital, and I'm sure we all want to pass on our thanks and appreciation not just to Joe, um, but to but to all his staff, and I know that John's on the call today, but they are all our NHS colleagues, including our primary care colleagues, are doing an amazing job at the moment. Uh, saying that, can I in, please ask each of you in turn to switch on your camera and introduce yourselves and the role that you play on the board? And I will start with uh, Nicola as Vice Chair. Nicola doesn't appear to be online, so we will go on to Richard. That's John. John, can you switch off your camera, please? Do we have Richard? He's not present, Chair. Thank you. Uh, John, it's your turn to introduce yourself. Uh, hello, hopefully you mean me. Hello, I'm John Blake, I'm the Deputy Chief Exec at Milton Keynes Hospital, and I'm standing in for Joe, who's um, at a national meeting. Michael. Hi, everyone. It's Michael Bracey, Chief Executive of Milton Keynes Council. Victoria. Hello, I'm Victoria Collins. I'm the Director of Adult Services with Milton Keynes Council. Felicity. Hello, I'm Felicity Cox. I'm the uh, ICS Executive Lead for Beverly Luton Milton Keynes. Tim. Hello, I'm Tim Davies, Chief Exec from Campbell Milton Keynes. I'm one of the voluntary and community and social business representatives on the board. Jane Hannan. Hi, I'm hi, I'm Jane Hannan. I'm managing director of CNWL. Vicky. Hi, I'm Vicky Heads. I'm the Director of Public Health for Milton Keynes Council. Jane Held. Hi, I'm Jane Held. I'm the Independent Scrutineer for Milton Keynes uh, Partnership. Tracy. Hi, 
I'm Tracy Keach. I'm the interim CEO for Healthwatch Milton Keynes, and we are obviously the Healthwatch representative. Tao. Good afternoon. I'm Tao Kufeji. Uh, I'm a local GP in Milton Keynes and representing primary care. Thank you. Rima. Hi, I'm Rima McCarum. I'm the independent chair for um, Bedfordshire Luton Milton Keynes Integrated Care System. Douglas. Hi, my mic didn't want to come on. I'm Councillor Douglas Cole. I'm the leader of the Liberal Democrats on Milton Keynes Council and one of the council representatives on the board. Hannah. Hello, I'm Hannah O'Neill. I'm Deputy Leader of the Council and I've got responsibility for health and wellbeing. We'll try Nicola again. Hi, sorry, I had some IT trouble. Nicola Smith, um, GP Chair of the CCG. Thank you. Mark. Hi, uh, Mark Tarbit. I'm the superintendent and the police commander for Milton Keynes. We've got a couple of people sitting in the suspiciously straight same room, haven't we? Um, Alex. Hi, Councillor Alex Walker, leader of the Conservative Group. I'm a member of the board. Thank you. Peter. Hi, Peter Wilkinson, a VCSE representative on the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. I have three officer colleagues present. Mac. Afternoon. Mac Heath, Director of Children's Services for Milton Keynes Council. Mel. Hi, Mel Marshman, Head of Partnerships and Resilience and um, providing support to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Thank you. And Jeremy. Hello, I'm Jeremy Beek. I'm Corporate uh, Quality and Policy Manager of Milkies Council here for an item. Thank you. Uh, I conclude all the introductions, so I'm going to move on to item two, which is minutes and actions arising. Um, Am I okay to sign the minutes of the board meeting held on the 29th of July 2020? Um, I will ask if there is any dissent from that. Super, I'll sign those minutes after the meeting. Uh, to consider the decision tracker 2021 and information regarding the previously agreed actions. Um, is that noted and has anybody got any comments? Can't see anybody. A couple more seconds. No. Super. We'll move on to disclosures of interest. Does anybody on the meeting have any interest in what is going to be conducted today, particularly pecuniary interests uh, in any of the business to be transacted? Noted. We will move on to the draft revised health and wellbeing strategy. Um, Vicky, and I believe that John is going to. Someone's going to share the slides, are they? Yeah, I think I'm going to share the um, share the draft strategy. Um, that seemed easiest. Uh, if that's okay, let me just make sure I get the right one. Thank you. Uh, is that looking all right? Legible? Yes, we can still see the top and bottom of the screen. Um, but it's fine. Yeah, I'm not sure I can manage that. It's not in PowerPoint, I'm afraid. Uh, right. Um, so uh, just to go through this briefly. Um, so as you know, we have a 10-year health and wellbeing strategy in Milton Keynes. Um, so that runs to 2028. Um, so this is a fairly light touch refresh of that strategy. 
Um, so, of course, we know that COVID continues to have a major impact on health and well-being, um, and we're anticipating that that impact is going to persist for some time, and um, particularly as the longer-term economic impacts play through. So, we felt it was important that our strategy acknowledges that impact, um, and so we've re refreshed, refreshed it as such. Um, we've picked that um, that theme of COVID up through each of the life course stages. Now, I understand a draft of the, the, the strategy, the draft strategy was circulated earlier on today. I'm just going to walk you through um, the, the, the draft changes we're suggesting. Um, so overall, the thrust of the strategy remains broadly the same. Um, so we've made... Um, uh, on the Our Strategy page, um, we've made reference to the overall impact of COVID on physical and mental health, um, emphasised the importance of the wider determinants of health in the context of COVID, um, and highlighted that some of the really important risk factors for severe illness from COVID are in fact preventable. Um, so if I move on, going into the starting well section here, um, we have just highlighted the impact on education for, for children and young people um, and mental well-being. Um, uh, also, the significant risk that more children are going to be pushed into poverty as a result of the economic impact of COVID. Um, under living well, um, we have highlighted the occupational risks for, that, that, that are, there are for COVID um, and also the risk of severe illness that we know is associated um, with obesity. Um, under the ageing well section, we have highlighted the um, impact of COVID on social isolation specifically. Um, and then uh, obviously our commitment to working together uh, remains the same. Um, so that just gives you an overview of the, of the, the draft changes that we are suggesting under that ref refreshed strategy. Um, happy to take any comments on the draft um, now or by email. Thanks, Councillor Marland. Thank you very much indeed. Do any colleagues have any questions? Who's hands up? Peter. Nicola and Peter. Hi, I was just wondering if it was whether we're thinking about the impact of um, not specifically the COVID infection, but the impact of the COVID pandemic on other sort of illnesses like delayed cancer diagnosis and all that kind of thing. Will that sort of form part of the strategy as well? I think that's a good question, Nicola. Um, I think we are, um, in terms of the areas we're focusing on specifically, it's more the broader impact. Um, but you're, I mean, obviously, what you're saying is is is, is really valid. Um, I mean, we can try and work something in to note that specifically as well, if if that would be helpful. Um, it is an important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That, that was really helpful. Thank you. I wanted to amplify what Nicola has just said, because um, I think that's going to be really significant. And also following a meeting with my voluntary sector colleagues, just to offer some support um, so that we can provide information and support for groups across the system. We've got a wide number of organisations involved in supporting people. Um, we want to collaborate with the statutory sector to ensure that we get the best outcomes possible for our residents. So it's an offer of support. Vicky? That's lovely. Thank you very much for that support. Yep. Um, I was also going to note that within the strategy, we are specifically um, looking at physical activity um, and cancer prevention. So it's not quite on Nicola's point, but um, I think it's still uh, relevant to that broader point um, around uh, health services more generally. And my apologies, Vicky, um, because I know uh, for, for colleagues that don't know, Vicky uh, works for uh, Central Bedfordshire and Bedford as well. I know the meetings are slightly different. You don't need to wait for me to ask you uh, ask you to speak if you want to answer directly. Um, that's absolutely fine. We're slightly more informal than other meetings, I, I, I'm sure. Thank um, you. Do any other colleagues have any questions or points about the draft health and wellbeing strategy? Have you anything else to add, Vicky? 
No, um, if people do want to suggest any tweaks to wording or anything that they think we've missed, very happy to take that uh, in the next few days by email. That would be helpful. Thank you. And I just want to pass on my thanks because obviously both Ricky and Ollie, who, who I didn't actually ask to introduce himself because he wasn't on my list, but is now. Um, I've obviously had a couple of other things on their agenda recently. Um, and so just thanks to you and your team for updating this, obviously, which it's really important, but obviously you've got some uh, pressing issues that you're having to deal with right now. So thanks to both of you guys and your team for being able to do this at the same time. Uh, so mm -hmm. there is a recommendation um, on the, where's the item? Is the item just to note it or to agree it? To agree it. Ricky, is the recommendation to agree this? Uh, I, I mean, if, if I'm very happy, it would be great to have that agreement. Um, but, but if you feel like colleagues might want another another day or two to um, read it at their leisure, I'm happy to, um, if we want to note it. I would perhaps say that we agree it with, but the committee, if the committee is happy to delegate minor changes to myself, and yourself in, in conjunction with the Vice Chair, I'm sure that would be a good recommendation. Um, Great. Uh, is the Board happy? Do I have any dissent from that? Super. Thank you very much indeed. And, and again, thank you, Vicky. Um, health and wellbeing strategy, because you're, you're up again next with the health and wellbeing strategy and your priorities. Again, this is a late paper that you're going to show. Thank you. Um, and I think our um, committee services colleagues are going to um, share that are going to project the slides for this one. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, obviously, by, in the sense that we have a 10 year health and wellbeing strategy, it is inevitably ambitious and very broad in scope. Um, so it's important that we identify a few specific priorities each year that are going to be our focus. Um, so we are bringing some suggestions for 2021 to the board today for those. Um, and I'm going to hand over to um, Oliver Mitten, who's the Deputy Director of Public Health, um, who can now have an opportunity to introduce himself um, and who can take us through these slides. Thanks. Over to you, Ollie. Thank you, Vicky. Um, so could I move on to the third slide, please? Lovely. Um, so back in February last year, uh, before COVID and before the world changed, uh, these were priorities we'd agreed for Milton Keynes uh, for 2020. And whilst attention has been elsewhere, I think it's worth just reflecting on what we have been doing in this space during 2020. So we had three themes for last year, and they spoke to these sets of priorities. Um, so in the mental health space, um, with uh, recommissioned and extended the um, COOTH tool, um, which helps uh, children um, with mental health and well-being issues. And that helps around 3,000 children each quarter, very significant and welcomed um, intervention. Uh, we have off the back of COVID-19, which has had significant impacts on people's mental well-being, um, being reinforcing and um, uh, pushing out important messages around people's mental well-being uh, during the last year. Uh, in terms of abuse, we have uh, developed, or colleagues in adult social care have led, but with our input, um, a um, domestic abuse strategy, which was finished and approved um, towards the tail end of last year. Um, and of course, there has been the ongoing work of the Child Poverty Commission, and I understand that's going to be discussed elsewhere on the agenda. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, ordinarily, we would like to have some data to inform what we might consider as our priorities for next year. It is uh, challenging at the moment to look at that data, not just because of resources, but because most of that data is in a sense of flux and has not actually been collected or processed in a way that we can we can look at it with any degree of confidence. Um, but I just wanted to sort of reflect on the three kind of parts of the strategy um, to talk about um, uh, the kind of things that have informed our choice of priorities for the next year. 
Um, so firstly, children, significant impacts for children in the last year in terms of loss of schooling impacting on their education, and that will affect their, or has the risk, has the potential to affect their future opportunities, employment, life chances, and ultimately health. Um, and in the short term, significant impacts on their social opportunities and their well-being and development, um, and significant concern about safeguarding and vulnerable children with schools being uh, an important um, means to protect vulnerable children. Um, for our concerns that child poverty have increased, um, to give you some numbers, um, three school meals, children accessing three school meals is a soft measure of child poverty. And that's increased from 7,200 in January of last year to 8,300 in October of last year. And there's concern that the economic impact will exacerbate child poverty in the future. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at adults, I think COVID has really shown us all how some of the underlying influences um, for people's affect people's health and well-being. So, how employment and financial security affect people's health, how people's opportunities to be active and socialise um, um, are different for different people living in different places, and influenced by how much income they have. And some of these different exposures have really dramatically affected people's likelihood of developing COVID-19, depending on what they do or where they live. And we've also seen how COVID has led to um, psychological pressures and stresses, and this has been reflected in an increase in the prescription of antidepressants and medications for anxiety. So it's one bit of hard data we do have. Um, and, and so just to emphasise the, these uh, things have been experienced very different, differently for people during COVID. And we've seen marked health inequalities for COVID outcomes, but many of the factors that have driven those have been exacerbated by the experience of COVID and like to be further exacerbated by the economic impact. So these differences are likely to widen um, in the future. Next slide. Um, looking at older adults, older adults have experienced the brunt of the pandemic in terms of physical health and being much more vulnerable um, to being in, in terms of likely being admitted to hospital and having a much higher chance of, of dying from COVID. But they've also had to isolate in very high numbers, not just in care homes, but also in their own homes. So real concerns around social isolation and what isolation and shielding will mean potentially for their uh, physical independence and also their psychological independence and confidence. Next slide, please. So uh, moving on, we've um, decided to retain this focus on mental health because I think that's a really underlying core issue behind much of what we've been seeing in the last year. Um, we've decided on a new focus on physical activity. And I think that partly speaks to people having spent lots of times relatively isolated and relatively inactive in their homes, but also speaks to profoundly important benefits that physical activity offers, both in terms of health and not just cancer prevention, but also preventing other long-term uh, conditions like diabetes and cardiovascular disease, um, but also its profound benefits in terms of mental health and mental well-being. Given all of the influence I've talked about and poverty and widening inequalities, we've chosen to retain and in some ways broaden that focus on poverty and inequalities. Next slide, please. Um, so this summarises the, well, highlights the three themes I've mentioned, mental health, physical activity, poverty and inequalities, and sets out the um, sort of markers within the strategy that these different things um, speak to. So I shall finish there and I'm very happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you. Could you leave, John, you leave the last slide up so we can, so we can see it? Um, I think that would be quite helpful. Thank you. I've got Douglas and Peter. So Douglas first. Hi. It's, thank you, Chair. It's, it's not um, a question, it's more a, a comment to say... Um, fully support um, these priorities. And the, the third one is actually the Liberal Democrat top priority is dealing with child poverty, and it's clearly going to increase. And uh, my, my wife happens to be a college lecturer and is and having to teach online. And, and, and children from poorer families are having to attend lessons on mobile phones rather than proper computers. So that, um, that sort of... <laughs> difference in quality in their education is going to be 
be there and have an effect. So that's something you picked up in your presentation is quite a concern. And um, obviously mental health is, is one of our priorities as well as a group. And um, with people being isolated for very long times, that's an increasing issue. And, and we know that um, suicide rates are going up, although you didn't specifically touch on that. And physical activity, with so many people being stuck at home, um, seems good as well. So uh, it's really just to be very supportive of the priorities. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Peter, and then I've got Hannah and Nicola as well. Thank you very much. Again, just to be really positive um, about the priorities and also the emphasis on preventative services. I think the group of people who met this week felt that it would be really good to see those reflected in commissioning intentions and outcomes. And again, an offer from the VCSE to support in any way we can and partner with you. Um, so that we can make the most difference. And, and just a desire, um, and I know we all know this, but a need to take account of the intersectional inequalities where they relate to vulnerable groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that intersectionality is a really good point, actually. Nicola? Hi. I, d I was just wondering if we, what evidence we have about reduced physical activity. Is this sort of a bit of a hunch that because people have been stuck in, um, they're doing less? Or uh, it's just a, a sort of thinking of my patients. Quite a lot have said, "Oh, I put weight on and doing less during COVID." But also, I've had some that have actually taken the opportunity to do a bit more exercise and, you know, out walking the dog. There are quite a lot of people out and about when I go out in terms of, you know, compared to what there have been um, previous. So I wonder what evidence we had. Is there any evidence behind that? Or is it more of a, just a sort of a gut feeling that people probably are doing less? Um, I agree, Nicola. We don't have any good evidence to, to support the hunch that people are less physically active. So it, it is more of a hunch. And I think you're right. It may be differentially patterned. Some people may have possibly because they have more access or resources taken this as an opportunity to be more active or more time because they're not traveling to work so yeah. i mean i think it's a good, either way i think it's a good thing because obviously you can enhance that if people have taken up better habits you can you know keep them going Absolutely. a little bit better can't you but um yeah i was just wondering really but, but what i would say is the population as a whole people are as a whole not sufficiently physically active nearly no, no, everyone a good... has a benefit to gain from being more physically Absolutely. active not not um, objecting to it <laughs> yeah uh hannah and i've got alex Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, um, really just to say I'm very supportive of these new priorities. I think anyone that knows me or has heard me in the last few months will know that I'm very passionate about tackling the health inequalities um, that have been so clearly exposed. And I think we've got a massive opportunity now to really challenge some of these. Um, and I think all I would ask is that we perhaps, when an opportunity, opportunity presents itself and things are a little bit quieter, we kind of get together as a system and really start to look through how we tackle these inequalities and have some really clear milestones and really clear, um, really clear idea of where we think, you know, where we have the measures of success. Because I think we, you know, we have got an opportunity, we're really pushing on an open door. And I think we have to grasp that opportunity while we can. And just while obviously we're talking about the inequalities, we just don't forget that the mental health inequalities that again have been so sort of so clearly shown through the last few months. Thank you, Alex, and then Tim. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you um, for this. And, and again, echo uh, support for the priorities uh, that you put out. Um, just some points. Firstly, I think this, this accurately reflects a motion we discussed at full counts. I think it was November, if I remember rightly, where we talked about um, mental health and the importance of uh, putting a real focus on that as we continue through the pandemic. So that, that's very much welcome. Um, I guess I've got just a few points and whether they need to be included or just some assurances that that's part of the public health team's thinking. Um, so addiction to um, and dependence on alcohol, um, ha, you know, has, has risen quite dramatically over the last 10 months and then no doubt will continue to do so. That is an area I think we should all be very concerned about. Um, while it's not specifically explicitly on the, the priorities list, um, I think that should be part of the thinking behind the the well-being and behind the mental health aspects. Um, Douglas mentioned suicide. That was another aspect, but I, I'm sure that can fit into the mental health um, priorities. 
Um, and then coming back to the uh, the point Nicola made about um, uh, keeping fit and active uh, and, and the fall in, in people um, staying healthy, um, there has been, and the council's acknowledged it through other um, strategic documents, an increase in those people, a number of people walking and cycling. Um, and I think there's something there to build on both through this and other aspects of the council, you know, transport solutions, et cetera. But there's also a public health aspect um, to that increase that we should be grasping as we do emerge from the pandemic. And then the final point is I think there's probably some narrative that's needed. It doesn't necessarily need to go in here. Um, but on strengthening public health partners as we do start to emerge from the pandemic. Um, you know, we're not alone in Milton Keynes. We have homeless charities. We have many other charities and organisations that work in the realm of public health. Um, and they will have taken a real, uh, taken on a lot during the pandemic and have been under a lot of strain and will need support and um, we'll need to work with them to, to strengthen them as we do finally emerge. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Tim. <laughs> Tim? Excuse me, sorry. Um, fully support the priorities. I just wanted to underline the issue around um, uh, health and fitness. We've certainly got evidence of um, voluntary sector colleagues who are putting a lot of work into that, and yet there's still a heavy um, kind of emphasis on doing that again from the perspective of um, occupational therapy and physiotherapy. So people are being overwalked and over supported in their physical health um, because it's an obvious priority and it's, it's a national concern. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Jane Howell. Thank you. As always, uh, from me, a slightly practical question, which is that this is it's really, really focused and helpful to see this. My presumption is, for clarity, that uh, these revised priorities will now feed their way through to the various other bodies, including obviously commissioning, but including the uh, Milton Keynes Together Partnership and other relevant bodies to be fed into current plans and activity. Is that correct? I think that, would be, the, that would be the plan. Yeah, um, I, I do have a, these are some of the things I'd like to pick up, I suppose, as chair, and just to see what the board think. Do we have any other comments? No. Um, just a reminder, if you're not speaking, can you mute your microphone, please? Because um, I think we've got somebody who isn't muted because I can hear some background noise. Um, you can leave them up. Um, I suppose my question, and there's a couple of points as well. The first one is sort of just a practical point, really, of these are very nice priorities. But obviously what we do as a board is we meet to discuss the priorities across the health and well-being system, not just um, not just public health priorities. Um, and what is, whilst it's obvious, but might not be up there, is the amount of time and effort it will co it's going to cost us across the whole system for the testing and continuing testing and vaccination program, whether it be. Um, the council or the CCG or the hospital or the police or even the fire service um, I think obviously that is a priority and whether it should be reflected here or not is it is just a fact and while a lot of this list effectively targets outcomes and improved outcomes there is just a sort of elephant in the room I suppose of vaccination and testing and the coordination of it is taking up a lot of everybody's time and capacity and is just obviously a priority for the system. Um, the second question is, I suppose, it's linked to COVID, but it's also linked to last year, is 
are we happy as a board, but also um, that abuse is no longer a priority, considering that there is a lot of evidence that abuse of children, both physical and sexual, but also domestic abuse has risen um, and I'm sure it's going to be, if Mark wants to comment, I'm sure that's going to be a police priority over the next 12 months, but it, it's now not a priority of the board. And although we have adopted the new domestic abuse strategy, are we happy that that domestic abuse strategy is now sort of embedded, or is, should it still be a priority for the board in resources and time and effort? And I suppose my last question is more of a question than sort of a, a discussion point. It's about mental health, and particularly children's mental health. Is what, what do we mean by mental health? Are we talking about mental health as in a health crisis, or are we talking about general mental well-being? Because I think there is an overlap, but they are two distinct things, and and meant. Mental health as in sort of an actual diagnosable symptomatic illness is slightly different than an overall mental health and uh, uh, mental well being issue. And I'm, I'm lucky, I mean, I'm not lucky because I lost a daughter, but we have access to a, a child psychologist. Um, no, no, very few people in the city do, but sort of that. That's very high level for some of the things that are just easy to answer, such as a little boy sort of has difficulty communicating emotions, what's quite good on helping him on that. That's not a mental health issue in one sense. It, it, you don't need to, it's not a prescribable issue. And, but the help and support that, that that little bit of information gives, such as, oh, there's a nice sort of help working diary over here where you can write down your thoughts and feelings every day, prevents escalation and I, I just I just like a little bit more detail on what we mean as a board and as a system about mental health um, because it's really important when understanding and allowing the CCG but also ourselves and other bodies on the resource targeting around mental health is it is it are we targeting health crisis or are we targeting general well-being Michael, I can see you want to speak. Um, thanks, um, Pete. I was just going to say that um, I, I, I do recognise the points about our um, use of the, the term mental health needing a bit more definition. I think Jane's going to say something in a minute from CNWL's perspective. We've got, we do need to move beyond our current kind of um, vocabulary, really. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was to just um, recognise that I think it's quite ambitious for the board to refresh the priorities at this point in the middle of COVID. Um, and I don't think uh, we will be able to include everything in this list, but it does feel a good uh, step to take to uh, just refresh uh, the, the priorities that we're expecting all the partners to be uh, focusing on in their respective organisations, voluntary sector and our other colleagues, and having that agreed and up to date for the city. So I don't think it's perfect personally, but I think it is, um, it's impressive that we've done it in the context of a pandemic. Can I see Jane? Is that Jane? Jane Hannon. And then I've got, I think, Nicola as well. Is that right? Or is it? No, it's Jane. the joys of remote meetings. Jane, can you unmute or, and or switch on your camera, please? Is that better? Much better, yes. Oh, sorry, apologies. Um, yes, so I was just saying my, my reading of the priority is that it is it's the whole, it's, the, it's, it's quite ambitious, it is the whole spectrum. So what we are, of course, uh, working on improving our crisis offer 
and we're working with part across partnerships, the, the council, the, the different health trusts and um, the voluntary sector on that. But we recognise that until we have more of a community wide offer um, and awareness, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll struggle to ever manage the continuing crises. So it's quite ambitious, isn't it? But um, but that's my understanding of it. And I think depending on which end of the spectrum you are, who's leading will change a bit. Um, and I think there's, um, and I know that the partnership board's doing a lot of work on that, but uh, yeah, that's my interpretation of it. Thank you. Who else? Mark. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, just picking up what on the two points you made, really, I think on abuse, we, we would want to be cautious about removing uh, child abuse from, from our priorities. I think you're right, you know, children need to be front and centre. Um, I'm, I wasn't aware that that was part of the plan, that abuse would be pushed out as we re scheduled our priorities but um it, it, you know our increased knowledge of um adverse childhood experiences and the causal links with a whole range of um you know life opportunities and exploitation and serious violence means that uh, it is something and, and you know and the domestic abuse idea you mentioned that as well that is that is always a priority for us and a lot of the the work we do is spent looking at domestic abuse uh, the impact that has on children, um, and then certainly how that abuse manifests itself, or that the 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 um, being exposed to domestic abuse, the impact that has on in their future behaviour, um, and in fact some of the you know the, the two murders that we've just had uh, within Milton Keynes both involve very young people. In fact, one was a you know what a 16-year-old murdering a 17-year-old. Um, and certainly the offender in that case had been exposed to significant, you know, and it's quite extreme childhood trauma experiences. So it, we would definitely want to have an eye on that. It drives so much of the higher risk issues that we deal with collectively. So I would just you know, echo your, your thoughts on that. Um, and around mental health, again, I think, I think maybe I, I agree. Um, it, it's often used as a, a kind of overarching umbrella term, but maybe it would be best to split into the strands that we want to focus on. So that crisis care, again, has quite an impact across all the agencies that are represented on this board um, and better management on the way that we use that uh, and manage those people will mean that there's, we're able to put our, prioritise our service, those services where they might be used to better effect in some cases. Uh, and, and actually drawing the distinction between mental health as a sort of well-being concept. Um, and then also the links to substance abuse. So I don't make me. I think you make a good point. Um, you know, we, we may not be able to articulate that quite so clearly as we want in this forum, but I think it does uh, probably need a bit more thought, as you suggested. Thank you. I've got Hannah and Vicky. So Hannah. Sorry, Pete, did you say me? I'm homeschooling three children and I've got a toddler running around, so I'm kind of running between different things. Um, I just wanted to come back on a, on a few things. I mean, I think Mark's absolutely right around the um, uh, adverse childhood experiences. And I think it's really important that we keep an eye on those. In terms of domestic abuse, um, more specifically, obviously we have got the Domestic Abuse Strategic Partnership now, um, who are taking a lot of the responsibility around domestic abuse. Um, um, and we've, got to, we've just got to make sure that we've not, we're not all doing different things. We need to kind of make sure that we, we put it through uh, one channel. And I think that's why we set up the Domestic Abuse Strategic Partnership to make sure we did have that, that, that sort of one channel. Um, so just to, to kind of have an eye on that. Um, and then just in terms of the, the sort of priorities more generally, um, I, I do think that we do need as a system something around poverty and inequalities. I do think we do we absolutely need a priority and something we can kind of link to and used to kind of guide some of the work we do there's some really great stuff happening in other health and well-being boards um nationally so i think you know we're not having to start from scratch here i think we can definitely get some ideas from other people but i do think as i keep saying we've got a massive open door here to push against and i think it's really really important that we start to tackle these inequalities that we we've you know we know are so damaging we've known for a long time but now we've also kind of got the public 
support behind it as well. So I think it's really important that we take that opportunity to really push some stuff through. So I, I definitely would want to see that stay in the priorities, even if we're not 100% sure about the, the new ones that have been set. Thank you. Vicky. Thanks. Um, I think I, I, I guess I just wanted to highlight thinking in terms of the distinction between the overarching strategy, which of course continues. And I think we're not we're not suggesting for a minute that any of the things that are in the strategy are not important. Um, I think this is around identifying the the few the fewer the, the smaller number of things that we want to have a particular focus on this year. And that's in my head, that's areas where perhaps some new thinking is is needed. Um, and I absolutely take on board the comments about the importance of um, ongoing work on domestic abuse. Um, and I think again in my head, I think as Hannah said, you know, we now have a really good system set up where it, uh, in my mind that that really important work is going to continue. And hence, I felt uh, I felt comfortable with it not being a priority for the Health and Wellbeing Board this year necessarily, um, but on the assumption that it is absolutely a priority elsewhere in the system. Um, so I hope that makes some sense. Um, and I think also in terms of the agreed priorities as they're set out, so the detailed um, wording in the uh, in the table that's that's up there on the screen. Um, so I don't think these are these are the, the the detailed priorities that come from the overarching strategy, and I don't think we need to feel like we're saying we're going to achieve achieve this this year um so those you know those persist through the duration of the, the full strategy to 2028 um, and i think michael's point around a bit of pragmatism with what we think we can do this year given the pandemic um is important but i think for each of these three areas that we've suggested as themes there are areas where the pandemic has in effect sort of shone that spotlight on on them as issues um, which means that we're in a sort of in a good place to capitalize on that additional attention and thinking that that there is across the system on these um so i hope that's helpful in just a bit more of the the background to our thinking on those thank you do we have any other comments no okay um I think I think you've just summed up, Vicky. Um, I suppose the, the two outstanding questions are, in one sense, it, it's not a health and wellbeing board strategy priorities for this year. It's, it, in one sense, this is setting the system priorities. Um, that's why we have a health and wellbeing board, and that's why in Milton Keynes we have the police and other agencies attend. And I suppose it's is the board confident enough um, to not have abuse on there because it is and it does look like a major theme arising from the pandemic and and whilst we have done good work in the past 12 months even if it is just an extra line at the bottom to say abuse and the system will continue to focus on abuse I think it's important that it is flagged. And I suppose the second one is Vicky and Ollie. I suppose it's the, 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 the vaccination and, and testing point and, and whether it just needs to be flagged as a priority or are we just going to take it as, as read that it is a priority across the system. Because, it, because the, the boards that um, Nicola and I and, and Rima attend about across BLMK, um, and, and the ICS um, vaccination and all, all of that thing if now now figures quite heavily uh, in the system discussions that we're having around funding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and and it will impact massively, particularly on the NHS, I suspect. I guess could I could I suggest that perhaps we pick up the vaccination bit as part of the um, inequalities angle um so just thinking about what the the sort of focus of the, of the health and well-being board might be uh, in relation to vaccination that perhaps having that um that view on on the extent to which uh, the vaccination program is um not exacerbating under underlying inequalities might be helpful that's fine um and are you happy with that we just add an extra line around sort of a fourth priority around abuse so it's a system-wide priority we're acknowledging it's a system-wide priority is that michael michael 
Thanks, um, Pete. It was just to say that our sort of sister board, the um, Safe for MK, the Community Safety Partnership, is also setting its priorities at the moment, and it is possible, I, I'm sure, that there'll be some uh, consideration there of tackling abuse um, as well. So it might be something to be picked up there, perhaps. Well, they should align, shouldn't they? If, we're, if, we're, if I have to go and you have, we have to go to a BLMK meeting, and convince Rima and um, Rima and, and, and Felicity um, and, our, and our CCG to to perhaps put extra funding in. Whilst it's okay that the Safer MK board might pick it up, I, I do genuinely think it is something that we need to be picking up as a health and wellbeing system as well, and that we don't work in silos across, across priorities. Really, I mean, it, it's not saying that it's a health and wellbeing board priority, but it's saying it is definitely, as Mark has said, it is and should be a system priority. Difficult to see sort of a consensus when you can't see the people. It's, it's an it's a interesting way of running a meeting, which is more of a, sort, more of a forum than a formal meeting. Um, are people generally okay with adding a line around abuse? Yes, certainly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. And I'll keep on independently scrutinising it. <laughs> Thank you, Jane, for the reference. That was Jane uh, Howard, who's the independent scrutineer. So. Um, with that, uh, the board uh, happy to agree that with the extra line around abuse uh, priority and picking up the vaccination and testing point uh, within inequalities. Michael, can you put your hand down? I will. Thank you. I will take that as consent and we'll move on to... Health and Wellbeing Strategy Measures of Success Exceptions Reporting. Vicky, again. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, uh, can I ask that we stop sharing those slides? Uh, I'll just, oh, I could change my own view, can't I? Um, so you have the exception report in your papers. Um, uh, and as you know, um, so we're committed to reviewing change against our agreed measures of success um, and reporting to the board by exception. Um, I think it is really important to highlight that um, because of the time lags in reporting um, on many of these measures at a national level, much of the data that we have at the moment relates to 2019 and early 2020. So actually, it, it really is before the substantive effects of COVID-19 will have hit. Um, so actually, the data that we are able to look at at the moment don't reflect the impact of COVID-19. And if I'm honest, I would say that actually looking at these measures at the moment is not overly instructive for us. Um, so in terms of the two exceptions that we are highlighting today, uh, the first was in for mortality. And this is really just to note um, that there has been a slight improvement in the latest data, uh, which reflects the three years from 2017 to 2019. So last year, you may remember, we saw a worsening from amber to red on this measure when we compare ourselves against areas with a similar level of deprivation. Um, we don't yet have that RAG rating for this year, but it looks like it may have got a bit better, perhaps gone back to amber. Um, but overall, in terms of longer trends, um, although performance on this measure is broadly stable, um, it is sitting at a higher rate than we would like. Um, the second area then to highlight uh, was this, the indicator of the second dose of the MMR vaccine. So again, this dropped slightly in 2019-2020, just by one percentage point, um, but that brings us under the threshold of 90% uptake, um, and we therefore are now red on this measure. And as a reminder, though, we would like to be um, reaching 95% uptake um, on this to reach that herd immunity type uh, level. Um, now, actually, we suspect that this, this figure may have dropped further this year, given the disruption caused, caused by COVID. Um, so although vaccinations have continued throughout, we recognise that there has been disruption and some families may have been disinclined to take up vaccination offers, particularly during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, now, I know that the CCG are working with NHS England to understand what's going on with MMR uptake and other vaccination uptake. Um, and, the, and to address areas that do have low uptake, um, and we're working them, uh, we're working with them on that. But obviously, as Michael says, uh, and however important childhood immunisations are, given the focus on rolling out the COVID vaccine at the moment, that that will be the short-term priority. 
Um, so that was just all I was going to highlight, um, and I can take any questions. Um, but as I would say, you know, we don't yet have the data that gives us a sense of what's going on more broadly, um, given the impact of COVID. I'm back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. Um, clearly both are a cause of concern and VCSE colleagues would like to help and perhaps work with local communities to raise awareness of the MMR programme and to support people to be a part of it. So that's an offer and also an offer of information and data from communities and lived experience. So very happy to help in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. That's really appreciated. Thanks. Thank you. Hannah. Sorry, just very quickly. Um, obviously, we've, we've been here before quite recently with the second dose MMR, so it's just a real concern. I remember speaking to Muriel before she left about how we don't want to kind of come out of COVID and go straight into a measles um, epidemic. So just what can we do as, as a system? You know, what can we put in place just to try and make sure that we, we are starting to get on top of this, because it feels like it's been a bit of a problem for us for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, and I would I would add we are not alone in, in this being a problem. Um, so actually, although we are red, I mean, and I'm not, although we are red on this measure, and I'm and I, we absolutely want to be reaching that 95% uptake level, um, actually, if we compare ourselves to areas with a, a similar level of deprivation, actually, we would be green. So we're not doing any worse than other areas are, but that doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't aspire very strongly to reach that 95% threshold. Um, so as I say, um, I, I, my understanding is that there is there is some work going on to um, understand where we are with this one better. And I do think it's important when we, that we start to get some of the newer data, so data particularly for the first quarter of 2020, 2021. Um, and perhaps we could well, maybe I could suggest we bring a brief um, update to the next health and wellbeing board um, on how, how things are looking with childhood immunisations. We could ask our CCG um, and NHS England colleagues to contribute to that. Thank you. Do we have any more comments? No. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, are the board happy to note that? Super. We will now move on to health and social care system update. Michael. Thanks, Pete. Um, obviously, uh, we've discussed at length uh, our commitment to working uh, in a more joined up way across health and social care. Um, the focus has been on addressing COVID in the last 10 months, but there has been progress made in the background on integration. And the very straightforward note that people have had in advance just gives um, a roundup, really, of some of the things that have been happening. Um, and I don't plan to go through it. I'm sure people can read it for themselves. Um, I wonder if there's any uh, points or or anything anybody wants to add. I'm aware Rima's with us this afternoon. She may have she may have a few comments. Peter. Thank you, Michael. I thought it was really helpful. Um, but I think you sold yourself short. I think you've done absolutely brilliantly over this period of time. And I've seen throughout all of the system-wide calls how people have um, supported each other, worked in a really integrated way um, for the betterment of our local communities. So just to say, well done, um, it, it has really felt very good. Um, and also to say that the Building Healthier Partnerships and the VCSC Leadership Programme has allowed the sector to work with the statutory sector in a very enabling way and has formed the development of groups such as the Vulnerable Communities Group, which feeds into the um, uh, Health and Care Operational Group and ultimately into the Alliance. So I just think you've done a great job and you should be applauded for it. Thank you. Thank you. Any more? Who's that? Tao. Tao. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, it was really just to say along similar lines, really, I think the the Health and Care Alliance that you referred to in the paper, Michael, I think has been a, a good example of um, partnership working across Milton Keynes. And I think the other point I was just going to make was how we're currently in that group trying to come up with priorities uh, for the Health and Care Alliance that link and derive from the Health and Wellbeing Board strategy and priorities. So I think in, in hopefully in the future, you will see the link between the two bits of the system and how we're linking up uh, the Health and Care Alliance priorities with Health and Wellbeing Board as well, just trying to get a flow of um, what we're doing across the system to make sure that it's consistent. Uh, so it has been a really good piece of work, I think, so far, but it is still uh, early days and we're still on a journey. Thank you. Do we have a Alex? Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, to the Chief Executive for, for his update. Um, I'd like to echo uh, the conversations for continuously working through the pandemic, um, and all the, the team's efforts um, to get us through this. Um, Milton Keynes, from an adult social care perspective, I think has performed um, much better uh, than a lot of areas across the country, um, and I think that's uh, down to the hard work and, and leadership of the Council. Um, one thing I just I just need to put on public record because I, I tend to do this at every possible opportunity is I, I still remain unconvinced that uh, BLMK is is the best thing for Milton Keynes going forward. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, and, and when it comes into effect, I, I look forward to uh, to being proved wrong. Um, but I and there was a report to the adult um, and social care committee uh, just before Christmas where we'd asked for essentially an update on how how uh, Milton Keynes' health pound would be protected. Uh, and that, that wasn't, uh, no assurances were really for, forthcoming in that report. Um, one point, and, and this is quite a more of a, uh, a point to, to Michael and, and a, a point of assurance would be appreciated, um, is for the system, once we are out of the pandemic, which I, I truly hope is, is at some point in 2021, um, I think it would be sensible for the system to take a collective deep breath and analyse where they are what aspects are, you know, have been neglected for completely understandable reasons through the pandemic, which, which aspects have been, um, had to have been closed off because of, of keeping people safe, et cetera, uh, and then to, to draw up a plan to address the areas where there is real need um, when we do get to that point. I appreciate that is some time off as we meet today. Thank you. Nicola. Hi, yeah, just to respond to Alex's point regarding the the financial paper that was um, sent to the um, the select committee for just before Christmas, I think the um, the CCG was asked to send a paper and not to appear in person. But obviously, if it would be helpful for someone to come and have a talk to discuss the finances across BLMK and hopefully give some assurance, then we would be very welcome to do that. I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not the expert, but um, somebody could come and talk if, if that would be helpful. Thank you, Nicola. Do you have anybody else? No? Michael. Thanks, Pete. Just to close that off, just particularly respond to Alex's point about having a bit of a stock take. Um, I think it is also true to say that the experience of COVID-19 has changed us. And I think when we do have that time to take a breath, I think we all need to talk about where we can have most impact rather than just producing more and more plans, boards, strategies and all of that. Because I think we've learned a lot through the last 10 months about how to get stuff done. And I'm sure everybody in the partnership wants to carry on with that um, rather than just go back to a sort of bureaucratic approach. I like that. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Do you have any more comments? Thank you. We're okay to note that and move on. Super. Child Poverty Commission report. Jeremy.
Hello. I'll just see if I get that. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jack. I am uh, the lead officer for the Child Poverty Commission. And what you have before you today is a mirror of the report that went to Cabinet in uh, December. That report uh, had as its annex the, the recommendations and also our second child poverty report. Um, we had initially reported in March outlining the issues. I think it's fair to say that it's very difficult to conceptualise the, the degree of uh, child poverty that in Milton Keynes. Um, and it's difficult to grasp. 22,000 children are in poverty after housing costs are taken into account, which is still 10,000 plus when it's just based on income levels. Um, and as we heard uh, from Ollie, over 8,000 uh, children qualify for free school meals. Um, and there are 970 children in temporary accommodation. Some of these children face double disadvantage. Uh, they are parents with poor mental health, have disabilities or long-term limiting illness. Uh, the numbers of children in poverty has continued to rise and it may been intensified by the events of the last few months. But in Milton Keynes, we have two unique features which um, are not really uh, seen in many other places, especially in the southeast. In all parts of Milton Keynes, meeting housing costs is more of a struggle than it is in many other places outside of London. And these households have at least one adult working uh, parent, or at least did have before the COVID um, uh, situation exasperated that. Um, what we presented in terms of the, the recommendations, what the Child Poverty Commission came up with, was a, a report that was addressed to the wider community as well as to the council and its partner uh, organizations. It looked to a difference, uh, to make a difference in many different areas, um, meeting immediate needs, uh, building resilience and finding solutions to the structural issues. And at the heart of child poverty in Milton Keynes are the structural issues, which will need um, some thought about how we, we deal with it. And sometimes um, for us to use our, our influence um, in a wider area for us to, to deal with um, um, effectively. Highlighting three critical areas of work within these is, um, is what uh, comes out of what uh, parents told us. They're looking for affordable childcare. They're looking for support, particularly in the housing, in, in meeting their housing costs. And also they would like to see more work built around the family and children centres in, in Milton Keynes. Um, that means that we need to, to look at not only what we deliver, but, but how we deliver it. Um, we need to spread ideas and get more people involved. Um, this is something that actually, it's not just for, for agencies and partners. This is for people across Milton Keynes. And we, we need to look at how we can inspire people to be involved. How we respond to the difficult, uh, practical difficulties people say they face, like transport, rent costs, living costs. But most of all, it, it speaks to our leadership. And you'll see that from the recommendations, the number one recommendation is to have a child, a challenge child poverty uh, group. Um, the, the, how that is going to come across uh, is, is, is for, for us to, to discuss, but, but there needs to be some leadership. Uh, the child poverty thought. The Child Poverty Commission was ably uh, led by Hannah Markham. Ha Hannah is a QC. She is the leading, um, one of the leading um, family family law 
uh, QCs in the country. In fact, she she won Family Law QC of the Year last year. And she has given us um, some inspirational comments that you'll find within the the report. Um, what she what she says to us that we really need to to look at uh, what we're doing and how we're doing it, and work um, to uh, the, to have clear aims. The commission, she says, wanted to draw on what we what we and others have learned since the last report and hear from those working on the ground, from their views, what was be what best could be done and should be done. She, she notes that the challenge is great, but she also notes how we've risen to the challenge of COVID and asks for uh, us to, to, to do the same for, for the next um, big challenge, which is child poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Peter. Thank you, Jeremy. Really sensible recommendations. Um, and again, an offer to capture the role of the voluntary sector and parish councils in providing a coordinated effort. Um, there was some concern um, regarding teenagers 12 plus plus and um, a feeling that they don't engage with the family centres. So it's how do we capture and continue to capture their voices and their needs within this. Um, and also my colleagues referred to a discussion facilitated by the Community Foundation about child poverty. And Paul Oxley from St Mark's Meals has been eager to progress it and set up a partnership similar to the model for the MK Homelessness Partnership to re-energise the work and get it moving again. So I just wanted to uh, make sure that that was noted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Do I have any more comments? Thank you. Um, thank, uh, are we okay to note that as a board then? I think it's very important and I think it's a very comprehensive piece of work. Thank you. Ofsted inspection letter. Um, who's going to take this item, Mac? Yes, thank you. Um, Mac Heath, Director of Children's Services of Milkings Council. Um, thank you. I'll just take the opportunity to contextualise this letter, if I may. Obviously, the details are in the letter, but just to confirm, this is uh, inspection that took place actually at the uh, for a three-week period from the um, 15th of September to the 1st of October. Is something that we've been awaiting for about four years. We last had a offset inspection uh, on our children's services and our safeguarding services four years ago. It found us at that point to be what we called re requires improvement across the various domains. We didn't think that reflected who we are anymore. And I think what we were pleased about, I think this letter endorses that that is not where we are now. However, obviously the challenge for us that came at this point of the inspection was that it was a new methodology that had been adopted by Ofsted due to the pandemic. There was a situation whereby they, to our disappointment, had decided to not give full formal gradings to the inspections in this way that they did it. And also the actual timing of this inspection came at perhaps one of the most difficult times for us as a children's system in lots of ways. We know that September is frequently a busy time for us anyway, as children are returning from summer holidays. And obviously we have an increase of referrals into our multi-agency safeguarding hub at that point. But obviously this September was even more of a challenge by the nature of many children returning from a prolonged period uh, at home and in lockdown uh, in, in September. But what I would say is that when we had uh, this inspection and over this three weeks, it was very integrative. It very much considered all the elements of our uh, safeguarding system, if you like. And I just wanted to pick out some of the uh, various comments in here. They were very careful, I would suggest, uh, our state colleagues, not to overuse or use traditional um, 
adjectives that they would usually use in regard to Ofsted. But I was very pleased when, and you'll see it at the top of page 43, when they talked about at, that, at the top of the page there about senior leaders, councillors, and councillors have promoted the development of good social work practice. And I think uh, the words good are um, used with intent often. And I think it really showed in light of the previous uh, good piece of work that's been done about child poverty, the, what came out of this is how much they recognise that the way that we approach uh, social care and our children's social work safeguarding is very much with that support and that family support and recognising trying to get involved in problem at an early stage is really critical. I very pleased in this in regard to the fact that they uh, there are a number of comments from example in the page 44 talking about how uh, those of our very high risk teenagers for example who are at risk at exploitation or uh, worried about trafficking etc how closely we work with our Thames Valley police colleagues into that and also the very positive comments that were made by our judiciary who obviously talked in the same way about they well to quote them judiciary is very positive about the consistently high quality of social Social work practice in Milton Keynes. Now, in regard to the, the positive frame of this, what I was very mindful of is that they have made uh, two comments, particularly in regard to uh, development areas for us around social work practice. The first point, which is obviously uh, those two elements are on page 43, one talks about case allocation and progression by ensuring that children are transferring from MASH quickly allocated and revisited and their plans are progressed. I uh, was challenging a little bit in regard to this finding because I felt there was a very uh, COVID related element to this. It was a particular point in time as I've referenced whereby uh, we were, had a, a huge volume coming into our front door in that September and a point of COVID. But what I would reassure by saying is that there was at no point any uh, case was uh, found to be unallocated, if you like. All cases considered had assessment and plans on them. Some were particularly what we call, were calling COVID assessed at that point, because obviously we were still in the um, a certain level of different levels of visiting and doing some online uh, discussions with children where we would have previously and historically gone out to visit. But again, those were very much uh, cases that we would consider as children in need. And they recognised in their work that they uh, inspected is that all of our um, child protection cases, our court cases, obviously were largely being progressed well. The other area they pointed out to us was around the quality and recording of supervision and management decision making, including the rationale for these decisions. We've taken a position very much, I think, in Milton Keynes, and I have, as a uh, in the time I've been in child protection, recognised particularly the work that Eileen Monroe did uh, in regard to the report on child protection maybe about 10 years ago now, who talked about us being risk sensible in our approaches and expecting our child protection social workers to be spending more time out visiting children than sitting behind a desk. And so we've been trying to be proportionate in regard to how much we expect our social workers to write up and record in of their visits. Um, but we we're recognising that Ofsted felt that we perhaps didn't do enough recording and sometimes our uh, analytical summaries weren't as maybe they should be. So we are looking at that in regard to our uh, quality assurance and our process this year of building that in a more, more robust way. But again, what I would say is that there was, uh, and obviously uh, it is in the uh, outcome report here, that the uh, what our social workers were recognised as doing is some really good social work. They were committed and caring social worker and uh, personal advisors that they met. They retained their positive relationships with children and they really ensured, as did our MASH, that the thresholds were right and only the right children, if you like, who needed to come into care, came into care. So I think the uh, for us, what we should recognise, I think, is a real development and improvement from where we were as a children's services system four years ago. And I think very much would uh, commend, obviously, our practitioners, social workers, and also our uh, other colleagues in both education, police, health, et cetera, who were very supportive also through this uh, inspection time. And I think we recognise that as a children's system, we've got a lot to be proud of and, and are in a very positive place. And I think the commitment and care that our Ofsted colleagues saw back in uh, September, obviously, is still continues to be evidence now as our uh, social workers and other colleagues are still going out visiting children and ensuring children are as kept safe as we can do. I suppose what I, I would would say 
is that obviously there are some points for us in here and we are uh, reviewing our uh, quality assurance framework to ensure that we uh, look at those developments and how we can continue to uh, move forward as a service. But I think uh, just to sum up this really, I think what's been positive for us that we can recognise in Milton Keynes is very much that this was a report or an inspection that we were awaiting for the last four years, uh, even though it would still perhaps on the Ofsted website say that the uh, requires improvement grading is the formal grading. I think this report shows how much we've moved forward since that. But also, this is the third inspection we've gone, uh, we've had undertaken since um, over the last three years. If uh, people remember, we had a SEND inspection back in 2018. We had a joint targeted area inspection into children and young people's mental health in 2019. And then this inspection of local authority children's services uh, in 2020. And the reason I I point that out because that's three inspections where there have been no priority actions identified from any of those inspections, which I think uh, really commends all of the work that's, that's gone on. So I just obviously wanted to bring it to the attention of the board, and I trust that they feel it uh, reflects uh, a lot of the good work that's happened and takes place and, and uh, how we can be assured of some of the uh, services that have been delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any comments? Peter? Just to say it's really positive and many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? Super. Thank you, Mac. Um, annual safeguarding report. Don't have anybody for this item. Who's taking this item, Jane? Um, I'm not sure. Mel. Mel. I can just introduce it if you like. Um, the report has just um, come to the board to note. Um, we are required to produce an annual safeguarding report in terms of um, our safeguarding partnership. This um, report, which has been sent to the board to note, has been signed off by the MK Together Management Board back in October. So it's really just for information. I think it's just worth highlighting that it was a transitional year for the partnership, um, but it does highlight um, some of the good work that's been done by um, the partnership boards and by the agencies that are involved in the partnership. Thank you, Mel. Jane? I presume it's me, Jane, um, as opposed to Jane Hannon. Uh, Mel just said what I would have said to um, support this report. It's uh, the three things I would say is it was a transition year. Uh, the second is it feels like a long time ago. But the third is the point that I think I was referring to at the beginning of the meeting, which is this is how key strategic priorities get delivered and looked at and reported on beyond this sort of high level system that we have in terms of uh, our high-level boards. Fantastic. Thank you. Do we have any more comments? Peter? Or is that a legacy hand? No, no, no it's not a legacy hand. Um, just to say that, that, that the report was uh, really clear and that colleagues were... Um, uh, thinking that it would be really helpful if there was a greater correlation between the safeguarding report and the wellbeing strategy and exception report, particularly around infant mortality. Um, and again, an offer from the VCSE to help in any way they can. And there were some concerns about, um, in relation to safeguarding, where there might be gaps, for example, child sexual exploitation, gangs and county lines. Thank you. Thank you. Good points. Any more comments? Mel. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, the piece of work to refresh the community safety strategy was mentioned earlier on, and I think that that will be a good opportunity to um, pick up some of the points that Peter has raised there in terms of child exploitation and gangs, which have certainly come through um, the community safety 
strategic assessment, which was looked at by the last Safer MK meeting. So it's 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 definitely still on the agenda. Thank you. I don't see any more comments. So I'm going to assume the board notes that and that's the last item on the agenda today. Um, does anybody have any other business? Peter. I'm so sorry, I will shut up in a minute. Um, just to mention that a motion was passed by the council in December to ask the Health and Wellbeing Board to set up a mental health task force. And I know that discussions have been ongoing um, and I know that it wasn't possible for this agenda, but just um, to note or understand whether or not this will be addressed going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody want to comment on that? Michael. Michael. Thanks, Pete. We haven't had a meeting of the um, uh, the MK Together Management Board since then, and uh, uh, Peter makes a good point, and it's probably helpful for us to have a look at it there and see what we've already we've already got as well, and come back with a recommendation. Thank you. Do we have any more comments? Thank you. Okay, that concludes the meeting. Thank you for everybody attending at form. Oh, Nicola, no, that's people logging out. There we go. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much. Uh, meeting concluded at 3.27. Bye.